Uh, my name is Matt Brownell. Uh, I'm going to present today on counterfeiting strategies and building brand integrity. With me is my colleague Pam Miller. Uh, we're going to pass the baton back and forth a little bit on various topics. And if you have any questions, group this size, feel free to ask as we go, or we can wait until the end and try to handle things in that format. Uh, so this is really part of our IP 101 series. The IP 101 series tries to give a primer on different intellectual property protection. Patents, trademarks, and copyrights is where we're really focused on. Uh, the other sessions to this particular series really build upon the exclusive rights afforded by those different intellectual property vehicles. Counterfeiting is a little bit different. Counterfeiting is going to focus on what I term as brand. So you are beyond the scope of your other intellectual property forms of protection. Uh, people are not buying your products anymore just for their function or their fashion statements, but instead they want your brand for the brand itself. Uh, so in a way, it's the culmination of all the other efforts you're doing with your intellectual property to achieve brand status, and then you get the ultimate form of compliment by having counterfeiters come in and try to knock you off. Um, <laughs> it begins as a good thing. It turns into a nightmare, um, and that's what we're going to try to focus on today. Uh, a lot of times when we talk to, to our clients about counterfeiting, and if you're in-house counsel, your clients are going to come at you with, with the same issues. The business plans usually focus upon firms with similar business models to your own. So I'm going to deem that as sort of traditional forms of competition. Uh, certainly maybe unfair at times, but not alternative forms of competition. So people with models like yourself. And the business focuses on products that are intended to reach the consumer. We talk about quality control, things that we want to get out there with the assumption that goods or services that don't pass our standards are going to be destroyed and don't make it to the consumer at the end of the day. That's right where the counterfeiters operate, though, is on the assumption that your security measures are intended to look at firms with similar business models to your own and that you're worried about products that are supposed to make it to the consumer. That's where we see most of our counterfeiting issues begin. Uh, counterfeiting is not a new problem, but it is an evolving and growing problem. Uh, on the screen now is the front page of the Landslide magazine for the ABA. This is the December 2011 issue where it's front page news uh, to people who practice in this area. Globally, it's estimated to be a $600 billion a year impact. In the U.S., the government pr uh, puts out $250 billion a year in losses due to counterfeiting. It's also a growing industry. There's estimates of 10,000% growth in the past 20 years. Uh, so it, it's a boom. It's a high-profit industry for those who participate in it. Uh, no industry is immune from the impact of counterfeiting, although the, the article on the front page focuses on you know, watches and presumably high-end luxury goods. Uh, there are plenty of other industries that are impacted. Uh, the airline industry, both the commercial airline industry and U.S. military aircraft, uh, have been found to have counterfeit parts in them, to a certain extent up to 2% of all Airline parts have been found to be, found to be counterfeit. <clears throat> uh, issues right away that start occurring, a genuine good may have an operational life of 20,000 hours. The counterfeit product has an operational life of 600 hours. So you can see right away maintenance schedules have to be adjusted. It really impacts how your entire product comes together if even one component of your complicated machinery is counterfeit. Uh, the FAA has determined that over 174 U.S. airline crashes uh, have a contributing a contributing factor of a counterfeit part in the aircraft itself. Uh, not limited to, to aircraft, uh, perhaps in a, in a more daily fashion, uh, automobile brakes have been found to be counterfeit products. Instead of having genuine brake lining, uh, products are made with compressed grass. Instead of having actual uh, transmission fluid, you've got a dyed vegetable oil that's used. Uh, instead of having the right filtering element in your oil filter, somebody shoved a rag into the outside can of the oil filter. A different type of product and different methods of identifying that you do have a counterfeiting issue. Uh, in this case, it was circuit breakers. We've redacted out the particular brand name. Uh, the story that's told with this article is that there was a, a circuit breaker, caught fire, burned down a house, liability lawsuit ensued. It took months into discovery for the defendant to even realize that it wasn't their product that caused the problem. It was a, a, a breaker that had their brand name on the outside, and there was a presumption that that must be our goods. Uh, but it turned out to be something that they did not manufacture, would not have lived up to their quality control standards had it been a genuine article. 
Uh, individual corporate losses are often difficult to quantify, but there have been studies by companies that have dealt with this issue over the course of years. Uh, one company, an automobile manufacturer, has uh, understood that they lost about 30% of the Southeast Asian market due to counterfeit product. Uh, another automobile manufacturer that we'll deal with in a little bit more detail later on uh, authorized five different Chinese factories to make their goods. Uh, it turns out that they had 50 different entities, separate manufacturing locations in China that those five had subbed out to without the consent of the brand owner or the knowledge of the brand owner. Uh, for our purposes today, I do want to make clear that anti-counterfeiting strategies and how you're going to build brand integrity are highly fact-specific. Uh, it's a plan that needs to be considered by the company over the course of several years. Your plan in, on day one is going to be very different than how things evolve in year three. Uh, and it does take an effort for you to stay engaged in the process and keeping up with the evolution. Uh, it is a multifaceted topic. We're not going to try to deal with every issue today. Um, instead, we are hoping to expose everybody, whether you are just launching a new product today or starting a new ent business enterprise, or whether you already have a brand integrity team in place that is considering these issues, try to expose you to one or two new concepts, maybe something to build on, or maybe a particular enforcement tool that you haven't considered in the past. Um, everybody's strategy is going to have to have one of three or all three basic tenants. You need to have a plan in place and a planning phase. You need to have a policing phase, and you need to have a plan for enforcement if you do, in fact, discover a problem. Those things are going to change over time. Uh, we're going to talk today about establishing a brand integrity team. It's a constant iteration of putting information back in the top of your funnel, figuring out a new strategy as you get more data on locating what the problem is and starting over in the process. So it's, it's an evolutionary issue. Uh, the question is, is it, is it offense if, you do, if it is, in fact, a counterfeit good that was used, if you didn't manufacture the good that was the subject of the litigation? It is. It, it interrupts the, the chain of causation. So it can be a complete defense to whether your company is held liable. Uh, it's not an absolute defense, however. Um, it's going to kind of depend on how the judge and jury views it. And in my mind, the state, the, uh, how far the lawsuit has developed at the time that you realize that this is not, you know, your goods, if the good was, you know, such a high quality counterfeit that even the brand owner has a difficult time recognizing it, and the court may view it, you know, in a different way. Okay, if there are no other questions, I'll turn things over to Pam for a while to talk about sort of the scenarios that we're hoping to avoid by participating in this process. Thanks, Matt. Part of the purpose today is that we wanted to give you some tools um, that you can um, use to hopefully avoid some scenarios that um, brand owners commonly see. Uh, I'm going to show you on the next couple of slides are some real life examples of problems that brand managers have encountered. Um, we've changed some of the information on the slides um, and replaced some of the products with fictional products, which you may chuckle at. Um, but the scenarios are real um, and they're really, really troubling to brand owners. One common fact pattern that we see is an electronic listing. Um, for a best-selling product in unlimited quantities. You know, you can see here um, billions of pieces per week are available. Um, and they're coming from a supplier um, that's located, you know, in this case in China. Obviously, this is a problem if this comes across your desk, a brand manager comes into you and says, what do we do about this? Uh, who's behind this? How do we stop them? How is this affecting our supply and our distribution chain? And this is something you'll need to talk about, uh, solutions for dealing with this type of fact pattern. Another fact pattern is when you see your premium product being sold at a fraction of the price. Here this uh, very lovely sweatshirt um, is available for retail for $79, but um, you can find it on the internet for 99 cents. This is a different approach you'll need to take uh, for dealing with this type of situation. Another scenario is where you um, see a listing for your company's product from a place where you're not even located. Uh, here you'll notice maybe your products always come from the United Kingdom and it says so on the listing, but the port that they're coming through is through Hong Kong. Um, this is another example that you probably have a counterfeit issue going on here. Um, and you need to first check and see whether this is part of your distribution chain. <clears throat> and if it's not, you need to figure out what steps to do to prevent it. Another common example are um, where you see scores of listings. Uh, these are eBay listings where uh, you have a number of suppliers that have cropped up and they've undercut your own distributors. 
And oftentimes you need to examine your own distribution chain to make sure, again, it's not coming from your own distributors. And you also need to figure out how to maintain your own margins so that you can compete here and, and put these guys, um, stop them from putting up these listings. Um, Matt already mentioned a little bit, one way companies are dealing with these types of counterfeit issues is through the use of a brand protection team. We did a quick internet search and we came up with um, these entities that advertise having a brand protection team. Um, you can see the diverse areas, you have automobiles and um, high tech and fashion. And Matt will go into detail a little bit more later about the different counterfeit issues that these um, entities face. But my point here is to tell you that these companies, as well as um, many of our clients, have brand protection teams, and it's something you may want to think about if, if your company does not have one already. Here's another document that we located that states that Toyota, uh, one of the largest car manufacturers in the world, did not even implement their own brand protection team mm -hmm. until 2006. Um, so if your company doesn't have one already, you're not that far behind because counterfeiting has, as Matt mentioned, has taken off in the last, you know, several years here and it's become a real issue for a lot of companies. Um, however, you don't want to wait too long if counterfeiting is an issue for your company um, because many smaller companies are now using um, such brand protection teams and it's really helping them, um, them counter these counterfeiters. One such example is uh, Lululemon and we found a posting here on the internet where they're looking for a brand manager. This is in 2012 and in November. So even smaller entities um, like this are looking for a brand protection team for their company to protect their um, profits and their intellectual property. And at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt to talk about um, oh, the brand protection team. So if, if you are an entity that's just starting this process, the place to really begin internally is the brand protection team. Uh, as Toyota indicated, you really have to have a team that's focused on brand protection. Worried about brand protection or really their sole accomplishment in their meetings is going to be brand protection and how to build the brand integrity. Uh, the next two slides are the core of that team. Uh, so if you're at the beginning stage of this and you want to go back to the business, I'd recommend starting with slides 18 and 19, uh, which are in, in your handout materials. This is to seed any conversations that are necessary. Um, but uh, a good brand protection teams that we have dealt with are generally small and diverse. Uh, so you really need to have somebody from legal, of course, someone from operations, someone from marketing, someone from accounting to, to help figure out how you're going to budget all these things. Uh, but those folks come together. If you have operations in multiple countries, you're going to want to have a representative from each division uh, participate in the brand integrity team. Uh, First place to start is figuring out what products are most susceptible to counterfeiting uh, and figuring out how those products come together. Uh, transparent operations are important. Uh, clients that come to us with some of the nightmare scenarios that Pam went through at the beginning a lot of times don't have a fundamental understanding of who they've licensed, how the product comes together regardless of who they've licensed to manufacture it, where components are made, how components are made, where packaging, packaging inserts, and other marketing materials come together. So the first place to begin is with operations. Uh, let's figure out how it all comes together and let's see what restrictions, contractual hopefully, we have in place in order to help restrict people from leaking things out of our supply chain. Uh, locally enforceable contracts, and I will bounce around a little bit on my bullets here, but locally enforceable contracts are the key. If you're in the planning stage and you're going to use overseas development, you should have a Chinese language contract or an Indian language contract, whatever the native language is, wherever your factories happen to be. Um, all too often we deal with companies that are working on a handshake in China. That's not standard business practice here. If you were engaging a, a firm that was a few miles away from you, you'd probably insist on a written agreement in English. Uh, I have not yet to, seen a, yet to see a U.S. court enforce a Chinese language agreement, and you also shouldn't expect a Chinese court or administrative body to enforce an English language agreement. Uh, so no matter how small your manufacturer is in China, you want to consider a locally enforceable contract. Uh, issues that need to be thought about in that contract are who owns the IP, who owns the, the tooling, how do we recover the tooling if there is a breach of the agreement, and do we have the right to inspect. Even if you are an entity that does not have feet on the street in China, you still want to have the ability to inspect those factories. Uh, we all know that Chinese labor is very cost effective. 
it's very cost effective to investigate in China as well. We can hire investigators at, on par as the, as the other labor rates in China. So we can get an agent to go in and take a look and see whether or not the factory is complying with their obligations. Once we sort of have a feel for how the product comes together and whether we have any contract rights and as part of the process of developing those, uh, we do want to think about the non-traditional forms of competition and the goods and services that are, are not originally intended to wind up in the consumer's hands. So where do counterfeiters operate? They operate near waste streams. Uh, a lot of us will have um, processes for destruction of goods that do not meet our quality control standards. All too often, however, you get a piece of paper certifying destruction, and we will wind up catching those goods coming back into the United States a year or two later through some of the protocols that we'll discuss. Uh, so you have to make sure that those obligations are uh, fulfilled at the end of the day. Uh, when you go through a, a particular generation of product and the business makes the decision to move on to the next generation, what happens to the old stuff that's in the inventory? What happens to the machinery that made the, that particular first generation product? Um, you're, you're begging for an opportunistic counterfeiter to continue to run additional product on that legacy equipment if you have not taken some effort to secure it. Uh, we have engaged a number of manufacturers in a burden shifting techniques under those contracts. While we have leverage at the beginning of, of the discussions and negotiations, we force them to agree to terms where they're going to pay for your policing efforts and your enforcement efforts in the event that a leak comes out of a factory that, they've, that they're using or that they control. We've had a lot more success than I initially thought we would have with shifting the burden to those manufacturers. We've even uh, convinced some to put up a bond so that we have a, you know, a reasonable cash method of collecting on that burden in the event of a breach. Uh, multinational vendors in the bottom right create their own set of issues. A lot of times we'll see an agent in the U.S. that's operating through Chinese manufacturers. We want to bind every entity that we can. So English language agreements with the American entity and then native language agreements with wherever the actual manufacturer is or their subcontractors are. Uh, technical measures is something that gets pressed in this topic a lot, be it color shifting inks, uh, holograms any other sort of way so that you can identify a genuine good as distinguished from a counterfeit good. Um, those are, are, are good systems once you have a significant counterfeiting problem, but a lot of times they're not cost effective at the beginning of the day. Uh, my recommendation on technical measures is that I, I, I really do not think that consumers look for that hologram. If they're going to buy a counterfeit good, they're not going to buy it because it you know, has a hologram or doesn't have the hologram. I prefer technical measures that, that are, are less obvious to the consumer, although there is an argument to have having that marketing value. You can do invisible inks. There are, are ways now where they've created digital media that can be viewed through an algorithm. So they have a, a system where you, you can give your sales staff an iPhone that has an app on it, and they can walk by a product and scan it with the app, and it will tell them right away as to whether the external packaging was authorized by the brand or was not authorized by the brand. There's no visible indicator as to how it works, but it's you know a completely secret way for you to determine whether a particular distributor has somehow allowed counterfeit goods to infiltrate into what they're selling. Um, very high tech, very secure, uh, and things to think about in the process. It all comes at a cost, though. Uh, so it's going to be fact dependent on the price of your goods and how much you want to add to that price by incorporating technical measures. Uh, the strategies for each one of these approaches needs to be different. Uh, you're going to want to act one way in a legacy market versus your primary market versus a growth market. An emerging market needs to be thought about earlier in the planning process. Uh, and e-commerce platforms require really a separate hour-long discussion. We're going to touch on it briefly today. But the e-commerce strategy is usually different than your brick-and-mortar strategy, uh, no matter what your products are. Uh, we have dealt with, with what the Chinese call vicious registrations in the past. Uh, those are counterfeiters that make their way into an emerging market before the original brand does. Perhaps they've registered in the EU with trademarks before you have managed to penetrate the EU. Uh, we have yet to lose on one of those situations where the counterfeiter beats us to the market, but it is an additional expense and slows down the business penetration. So key planning in your trademark portfolio and management of your trademark portfolio can help you deal with those vicious registrations in the emerging markets. Um, once you have a brand protection team in place and things are evolving and you've allowed some time for data to inflow, uh, I do recommend building a profile of your counterfeiter. 
Are we dealing with simply opportunistic folks uh, that have found goods in the waste stream and realize that they can make a profit off of it? Or are we dealing with more of a criminal enterprise, you know, false fronts, false storefronts, false registrations, false addresses, false names, fake bank accounts? Um, how far does it go? Different strategies are necessary depending on how you're viewing your counterfeiter profile. Or do we have something in between, of which uh, exists quite a bit? Trademark portfolio management and IP asset management get wrapped together. Trademarks are where we think Lanham Act violations for counterfeit products, uh, but other IP assets can certainly be considered, particularly copyright and design patents on goods that go to market. Um, so you have to have a, a broad view of these things. It's not simply limited to trademark registrations and how we're using those registrations. Uh, consumer education is an approach that everyone needs to uh, consider. There are good arguments to participate in very active consumer education about your counterfeit problem, about avoiding buying counterfeit products. Uh, there's also reasons why businesses do not want to advertise that they have a leak in their supply chain or potentially distribution chain. Uh, but I do recommend that everybody give it some consideration, and Pam's going to take us through a few more detailed concepts with that. Um, <clears throat> so sort of with those bullet points in mind from the past two slides, we represent the brands that are advertising the existence of their brand integrity team or brand protection teams. And the purpose of this is to demonstrate how different the strategies need to be. Okay, so if you're a software company, you have digital media, uh, very low barriers to entry for copying and manufacturing, certain susceptibility to counterfeiting as a result, one plan kind of needs to be in place. If you're a luxury good, there's a question as to whether your consumer cares at all your consumer probably knows they're buying counterfeit. That's a different strategy than the consumer that's really been fooled. Um, companies like the car manufacturers, you know, I have yet to see very many stories about a counterfeit vehicle. So they're dealing with parts and they're dealing with non-core products. Hats, t-shirts, keychains, you know, things where the brand appears that are perhaps not you know, true revenue generators for the business, but can indeed impact uh, how things are gonna flow. And I was surprised somewhat to see the Olympics advertising their brand integrity team. When you're dealing with Major League Baseball, the NFL, the policing that goes on with the word Super Bowl, for, for example, if you're familiar with, with those stories, um, very different sorts of approaches that they need to take to brand integrity and counterfeiting. When you have a spike in demand once a year, once every four years or two years in the Olympics program, it's gonna take a lot more physical resources at the location than if you are dealing with goods and services that are offered every day. So the purpose of that slide is just to indicate, you know, you really have to look at your particular fact pattern and figure out what sort of strategies are gonna work for the company. So once you have your brand integrity team in place, where do you begin the process once you've sort of selected strategies and company philosophy? Uh, one place that we like to begin is with the US Customs and Border Protection Service. Uh, we make this recommendation because it's a highly efficient way to kick off your program. Uh, Border Protection offers a lot of services to brand owners, um, and they do a lot of good for the country that really doesn't impact your bottom dollar. So you can get started in a Border Protection program for between three and $5,000, that's all included. You're gonna put 3,000 Border Protection agents at your fingertips looking for counterfeit goods to the extent that they're opening boxes that pass through, through our borders. Um, they put out a lot of information, Border Protection does, on the IPR seizures, intellectual pri property rights seizures that they make. And there's a lot to be learned from the, the brief statistics that we're gonna talk about here. Uh, 2011, it may not come as much of a surprise that 80% of the seizures came from China and Hong Kong. Um, what you'll see is over time, these numbers really have not changed significantly over the past four five and six years. In 2007, it was 86% of counterfeit goods were arriving in the U.S. from China and Hong Kong. Um, the 2012 numbers came out recently, and you'll see that it's a bit difficult to read, but China and Hong Kong combined for 84%, although I do like the graphics that they've switched to to sort of emphasize the, the issues. Um, what, what has changed, while it hasn't been the source countries that have, have undergone much evolution, what's really changed is how the goods arrive in the United States and those are represented by the uh, shaped bars above the U.S. on the map. 
Uh, it used to be that counterfeit goods arrived in large shipping containers at ports, shipped via boat, ship in some sort. Uh, so U.S. Border Protection focused their enforcement efforts at large ports. Uh, the values of their seizures when they found them were significant. Uh, however, the model has changed significantly, and more and more goods are arriving in FedEx, DHL, UPS packages characterized by Border Protection's Express, um, or even through the U.S. mail system. Um, you know, almost a 10 to 1 ratio over what's happening in the ships. Uh, that's, of course, going to lead to lower dollar value seizures, but an increase in the number. In 2011 and 12, intellectual property rights seizures were up 24% by customs just in raw numbers. They were up 44% in terms of co consumer safety and critical technologies. Uh, the value of low dollar seizures defined as $1,000 or left, less was significantly increased over past years. And these other slides, the next two or three, um, emphasize the shift that's gone on from you know, cargo to express. In 2007, it was about even. In 2011, it's become a four or five to one ratio in terms of goods being seized in express mail packages as opposed to through the cargo ports. The 2012 data supports a similar analysis. So no longer are Los Angeles and New Jersey the only ports where you have to police. You have to look, spend an equal amount of time in Louisville, Kentucky, or other places where international airports allow uh, cargo hubs to operate. Uh, the process is, is relatively simple. If you have a registered U.S. trademark through the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, you can record it with border protection. The border protection cost is under $200. Uh, there's then <coughs> a number of programs that can be used to train the border protection agents on what to look for in counterfeit goods. You can take your product to key ports and demonstrate through a, a trade show seminar what to look for in terms of the tells of what's counterfeit and what's genuine. The border protection agents really respond well to those in-person training. They're not necessarily practical when you're first beginning your process. You don't know where to look. You know, where are we going to focus these training sessions? Uh, so what we recommend doing is beginning with the electronic services. Uh, those border protection agents, uh, up until this past year, would receive a CD that would identify all the tells. Uh, it's a relatively narrow CD. There's only 30 brand owners that participate in it every year. So it's really an underutilized resource. It's not necessarily limited to 30 but just so few people follow that program. Uh, this next year, in 2013, it's gone to a web-based system. So th there's a lot of argument by the folks involved here because the Board of Protection likes to operate off their laptops. You know, they have the vehicles, they have people out in the ports, uh, and they do like the CD program. They don't always have internet access to pull it up. But I think the, the web-based system is gonna allow you to update your tells more frequently and hone in your information as you go. So there, there, are, there are very cost-effective ways to participate in this electronic training process. And again, there's 3,000 border protection agents that are out there working for you. Uh, opening goods, very responsive. If you're responsive, they'll inform you within 48 hours that they've got a package that's suspicious. They'll ask you if it's counterfeit. If you confirm counterfeit and you can actually purchase a sample from, from customs, they seize it, they destroy it, and we're going to go through more on that process right now. Um, so once Border Protection determines that they have a suspicious package, they will begin, when you're new in your process, with sending you photographs of the product, potentially a sample, asking for your opinion. Once you've established a rapport with Border Protection, though, their seizure is automatic. As soon as they see a suspicious package, they seize it. Uh, what happens next is they generate a letter to you, the brand owner, that starts to give you information to provide data to your brand integrity team. Uh, so here we have a date. We have the particular port, Louisville. How many units have been seized? Where, where they came from, both in terms of country and the name of a particular exporter, and where they're going to. So now we've got information that we can use to make critical decisions on how our process is going to work. Uh, plus, we've removed just through this one process 500 counterfeit units from the stream of commerce. Uh, one seizure is nice, but if you let your program develop over a couple of years, you're going to start getting significantly more data. Uh, so we have different dates here, different ports, most of which are in Southern California. Louisville is still appearing, and that's a different seizure in Louisville. So now we're able to focus our training efforts on the ports where we have already seized goods. Uh, this particular screen represents the seizure of around three to 4,000 different counterfeit items in a two-year time period. Uh, so you're getting you know, bang for your buck right away from this process. Uh, in our experience, we have never received a challenge to the seizure. 
And at the end of the day, border protection incurs the cost to destroy these goods, and they're off of the marketplace. Uh, what you can do with this information is make decisions on how you're going to treat people who are importing counterfeit goods. It could be as simple as a company-generated cease and desist letter. It could be outside counsel involved in the cease and desist letter process. It could be requests for information. It could be surrender of existing inventory that made its way through customs. Lawsuits are always an option as well. You can also use the information on the origin to seed investigations in the country of origin, China and Hong Kong in this case, to try to go after the supplier directly. Um, an additional benefit, though, is that you're not the only one getting this information. The person importing the counterfeit goods gets a letter from customs as well, informing them that the goods they were seeking to bring into the country were indeed counterfeit. Uh, this is important because it provides us with proof of intent down the line. Any sales that are made by that particular importer after the date of this letter, they knew that the product was, was counterfeit now. And they know to begin with at the price points that we're dealing with probably, but proving intent is always difficult. Um, it's something that if you're going to consider criminal prosecution, the prosecutors are going to ask for what's your proof of intent, and this letter gives it to them. It's, it's easy and it's obvious. And more often than not, we see that the counterfeiters will ignore the letters that come in from Border Protection, and this has universally worked to our advantage uh, because they, they ignore them. They don't tell their lawyers if they get lawyers, if we get to that point where we're in contact with them. They never mention to their counsel that they've received notice from Border Protection that they're importing counterfeit goods. So that really helps your leverage in how you're going to handle uh, negotiations down the road. Um, so Border Protection, I think the overall cost of the entire program, including education through the DVD process or web process, is under $5,000. Um, it's good for 10 years once you sign up for the program, and it's passive. Uh, those Border Protection agents are there without ongoing cost to you. And it's terrific if you wind up in a lawsuit over you know, a counterfeit good, for example, to present to the, to the fact finder all the efforts that you're going through to avoid these problems to begin with. This product never should have made its way into the U.S. because we do have efforts with the government to, to stop it from happening. Um, I'm going to turn things back over to Pam if we don't have any questions on that portion to talk about ways to attack consumer demand. Let's talk a little bit more about consumer education. Matt mentioned um, consumer education as being one of the tools that you can use to um, help um, counter your counterfeiters. And um, consumer education is a strategy that we discuss um, in detail with some of our clients um, because it is a way to reduce demand. And a company can spend a lot of time trying to track down these counterfeiters. You know, you, see, you get these reports in that Matt talked about. Um, you see the country of origin, China, and different locations. Well, we kind of joke around the office saying that it's kind of like a game of whack-a-mole. You know, you pop one down, another one pops up somewhere else. So um, sometimes trying to educate the public about, um, you know, the negative effect of, of counterfeit goods and um, maybe some of the health and safety issues can kind of curb the demand and then there isn't that demand for the counterfeit products and maybe it's a, it's a two-prong approach. Uh, a lot of times that's necessary to kind of reduce the demand and then also go after the counterfeiters themselves. The nice part about consumer education is that you're not the only company that's trying to educate the public about the negative effects of counterfeiters. I mean, you've got all the other companies trying to put information out there, um, so you're just one of many. Um, here's an example, um, a company UGG. You probably all know UGG is a brand of boots. It's owned by Decker's Outdoor Corporation. And Decker's is really active in anti-counterfeiting measures. They're a member of the um, IACC, which if you haven't heard of, it's the International Anti-Counterfeiting Coalition. Thompson Coburn is a member of the IACC. And this coalition co um, consists of brand owners who are willing to share their experiences and their strategies for dealing with counterfeiters and brand integrity issues. And this slide is just an um, excerpt from one of UGG's presentations that they've shared. Um, which you can see it's timed around the holiday season and they put out information to the consumers to educate them and caution them against buying counterfeit UGG products. And um, UGG, if you don't know, has some complicated counterfeit issues. Their boots, when they get imported, sometimes they'll find false bottoms that have been put on their boots and then over, once they get into the United States, people, they have people over here that remove the false bottoms or the false labels that get put on them so they can get through customs. So they have a very complicated um, counterfeit, you know, um, process that they need to go through where maybe your company doesn't have as many um, layers of um, counterfeiting going on. 
This slide is an excerpt from eBay's buying guide. Rolex participates in um, the guide on eBay, and they um, put it out there so consumers, before they buy a product, they can check and make sure that the product that they're buying off eBay is not a fake Rolex watch. You know, provides an example. Here's what a real one looks like. Here's what a fake one looks like. And a lot of companies also put similar information on eBay or also on their own websites to allow consumers to go there and check out how to tell a genuine product versus a fake one. You know, if you know that information about your product, if you know what the counterfeiters are doing that's, you know, cutting costs or something like that to look for, you can, you can tell your consumers. Other companies are going a step further um, and advising consumers about the risk of identity theft when they deal with counterfeit merchants. Um, this is just, you know, um, some entities set up false sites that we've heard of where if you go about ready to pay for your good, you know, Scream will come down and say, you know, if we would have been a counterfeiter, we would have now had your credit card information, we would know your, um, all your identity, we could, you know, steal your identity and also you would hurt, hurt our company, but luckily for you, we're not, you know, we're not a counterfeiter. So some of these kind of like false sites are trying to warn the public about um, identity theft issues that can happen with, when dealing with counterfeiters. In addition, there's organizations um, that are willing to bear some of the cost. Um, one such organization is the National Crime Prevention Council. And the next several slides I kind of put in here um, just to be able, you know, show what are out there, these um, public service announcements. You know, these sneakers were a steal, literally. Uh, we also have PSAs to help consumers think about the health and safety issues when buying um, counterfeit drugs, for example and also PSAs that inject a moral component into the message. If you buy a counterfeit handbag, for example, you yourself are phony. The government is also uh, contributing to the process. The State Department has relationships with their equivalents in foreign countries to try to address these counterfeit issues. The State Department website uh, is a good resource. It has links to a lot of their ongoing efforts. In addition, ICE, the Immigration and Custom Enforcement, is a division of Homeland Security. It's participating in this process as well. They are basically the policing force behind Homeland Security and uh, Customs and Border Protection, and they put basically uh, make counterfeiting uh, criminal aspect. Um, in this example, ICE is again timing around the holiday season, um, kind of making this arrest known that counter, you know, these counterfeit people. Um, are under the watchful eye of the government and getting caught um, to try to curb some additional counterfeiting activity. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Matt to talk about electronic markets. Uh, so electronic marketplaces require their own specific strategies, and it is a topic that could take up all day in and of itself. Uh, we're going to limit ourselves to one example here, and that's uh, in many ways the biggest perpetrator of the issue is Amazon.com. Uh, it's a wonderful sales platform. Uh, everybody's business likes to participate in Amazon because it presents such uh, low barriers to entry to get your marketplace out there. It offers a per fairly high return on investment for genuine goods. Uh, however, there's some things that you need to be aware of when you're dealing with Amazon in your own business transactions, and that starts off at this page, uh, which allows anyone to come in and enter in a UPC code for a, an article of goods, and if you've are allowing your products to be sold on Amazon, you've probably given them your own internal marketing materials, and part of that license agreement that you signed off on allows them to use those marketing materials to advertise anyone's goods on Amazon that enters into that UPC code. So if you're a counterfeiter, you're going to try to establish some products that are high profit for you. You're going to go to Amazon. You're going to take a look at selling price. You're going to go to a number of Chinese wholesale websites, figure out how much you can buy the products for, pick the ones with the highest margins. If the goods are already being sold on Amazon, you have instant access to genuine copy of marketing materials, making it impossible for a consumer, a brand integrity manager, law enforcement, to identify from the listing alone that it's a counterfeit good being sold. Because um, why? Because this is you know, information that's already been authorized by the brand owner, and by the time the product gets sold at the end of the day, the consumer may or may not realize any differences between that and the marketing materials that they viewed at the beginning. Uh, so it, it creates its own set of circumstances here. Very easy for people to come in and wind up with a global marketplace. Uh, we have dealt with counterfeiters who are profiting to the tune of over $10,000, $20,000 a month just through their Amazon sales of counterfeit goods. 
Uh, when you're talking about profits, you know, these are primarily individuals operating out of condominiums or apartments. Uh, they're easy to move around from place to place. They're not inventorying anything because Amazon offers a warehousing service and a fulfillment center. Uh, several actually pass throughout the country. So for you know, um, investment of a couple hundred dollars, you can wind up with a $250,000 a year revenue generating business as an individual where you don't have to have anything, put your hands on hardly anything at all. Amazon handles everything for you from marketing to back office functions to fulfillment and sales. Um, and of course you're not reporting on your taxes. Uh, one aspect of this is the Trey Milano case that will help uh, everyone understand Amazon's position. Uh, Trey Milano makes a relatively expensive flat iron. Uh, they follow, Amazon follows a process where they allow brand owners to file a NOCI, a notice of claimed infringement, with Amazon. We think this product is counterfeit. Please take it down. Please delist that seller's account. Um, Amazon has a policy that they will not allow you to cite things like branding, marketing materials. They want that brand owner to actually go in and buy a sample of the product from that particular seller and confirm by viewing the sample that it's counterfeit. Well, that is slowing down the process. It's going to take weeks for each particular account that comes up, and oftentimes by the time the product is received by the brand owner, the Amazon seller has already closed out the account and moved on to a new brand name, new seller name, um, and they won't you know, line up in Amazon's records with the sale of a counterfeit good. Uh, so what happened in Trey Milano? Trey Milano, Mr. Day, bought his wife a birthday present. Uh, off of Amazon of the Instyler flat iron. She plugged it in, it exploded. Um, as she had it up to, to use it, uh, harm to her hand, her ear, her hair burned, uh, relatively significant damages from you know, this sort of product. Uh, it was not a product that Amazon fulfilled through their order process, uh, but as the lawsuit played out in California state court, um, <coughs> uh, Trey Milano tried to impose a duty on Amazon in light of their refusal to follow a reasonable process. And Trey Milano's process was, was exceptionally reasonable because they had confirmed, not only through their notice of claimed infringement, they had confirmed dozens of counterfeit products being offered. Unfortunately, the state court determined that Amazon owed neither Trey Milano nor Mr. and Mrs. Day any duty to police goods, even those goods that were actually in Amazon's possession and where it was reasonable to infer they realized they were dealing in counterfeit products. So this, this decision has really emboldened Amazon's position on what it's willing to do for folks. Um, there are avenues that Amazon will cooperate with you on if you are a brand owner, but it is an uphill battle in every sense of the word. Um, however, there are alternative means that, that are helping out and better case law for us depending on where we're going to look, and Pam is going to talk about those issues. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, another avenue for companies to consider is cutting off the merchant accounts that these counterfeiters are using. And one such way to do this is through participation in the IACC's uh, Payment Processor Initiative. And I don't know if you've heard of this. It's a relatively new program, but it's designed uh, to stop payment on and offline to counterfeiters. It was developed as a collaboration between the IACC and the payment industry. And as you can see on the slide, the current partners include several major credit card companies, MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, or American Express, Discover. And um, how does this process work? It's basically the IACC has an online portal where brand owners can report sites that they believe to be counterfeit. You enter the URL, the information about what you think is uh, you know, your brand, your IP right that's violated. It's a relatively simple form then the IACC reviews that and distributes it to the um, proper payment network. And typically at that point, the merchant payment method is then terminated. And the brand owners can keep track of all their different reports online. So if you have a brand, um, brand manager or someone at your company, all that's in one location and you have all these ongoing um, basically complaints to the IACC about these websites. And uh, TC, as I mentioned, is an IACC member. So your individual company does not need to be a member um, we can assist you with this process if it's something you're interested in. This process was launched uh, January 2012, and since that time, um, they've had a remarkable um, time at, they've been remarkably successful at re stopping the payment to counterfeiters. As you can see, over 
Um, 3,500 websites have been reported. 91% of payment channels to these sites have been terminated. And over 1,000 individual counterfeit merchant accounts have been terminated. And Matt mentioned a positive case here um, is the Tiffany versus Forbes case. Um, this is one where the court system is starting to catch up with some of the, uh, these concepts. Um, this case is currently pending on appeal in the Second Circuit in New York. And in this case, Tiffany identified counterfeiters um, via their websites and tracked down their bank accounts through their own investigation. Um, during the loss lawsuit, the court enjoined the counterfeiters and closed down those sites. There were three banks involved. Two of the banks stopped processing the payments. One of the banks, the Bank of China, continued to process the payments even after the court enjoined them. Um, the court held that with respect to the Bank of China, the assets being held uh, in China could be frozen by the court in New York because the bank was subject to personal jurisdiction in New York because it operated a branch there. Also, the court held that Tiffany could get discovery from the bank located in China without following um, the requirements of the Hague Convention which made things easier for Tiffany. And uh, this case is a good example of how the courts are starting to give brand owners some teeth against the counterfeiters overseas. And so in summary, I know Matt mentioned, um, you know, that each dealing with each different company, everybody has their own specific issues with counterfeiters and it's very fact specific. So you'll need to implement a strategy for your company that works with your own particular facts. Um, we're certainly happy to help you implement any of these strategies that we have seen and done in the past. Um, and also, at, over time, you'll start to see um, that your efforts will really pay off as you start to identify locations where counterfeiters are and um, um, strategies over time will um, develop. Um, so we hope you enjoyed our presentation. And at this time, we'll open the floor for questions, if anyone has any. Do you have any uh, idea, percentage-wise, uh, how much of this counterfeiting is? I would take it that the, when we remarked that the great majority of this is component parts that go in uh, to a, an assembled product and sold under the brand owner's name. But I expect there is some where there's freestanding, well, just a freestanding part uh, that is counterfeit all the way and sold directly to consumers. Do you have any information on, on that split? I'm not aware of any studies that have kind of dealt with that issue. Um, but, you know, in a way, from, from a counterfeit enforcement perspective, it's all the same. Any good that's manufactured without your authority, whether it has one part, whether it's the product in a counterfeit package, whether it's a counterfeit product in a genuine package, um, all fits underneath the same rubric for how we would police it. Um, frankly, I've seen more of the entire product being counterfeit uh, than I have of individual components. We generally don't you learn about those components after some disaster. <laughs> um, rather than in the planning and policing stage, it, it comes up you know, in an enforcement stage or in some post-disaster investigation. We kind of a fun situation. We had a trash can difficult to, uh, to obtain quick and efficient release in China. Um, it's better than it was 10 years ago. It's better than it was five years ago. Uh, so we got to push it down within about a month. So, yeah. so it's becoming an effective system for enforcement of rights, uh, provided you have all the money started and T's crossed to you. All, all things to think about with the planning stage. If you're going to need to enforce intellectual property rights in China, you've got to really give yourself a 90 day head start before you approach their administrative entities. They require specific uh, people to attend test purchases. You have to have a, a notary of sorts actually witness the product or pass hands in order to certify that it was a, a transaction that could be admissible for the administrative entity. Uh, their versions of certified copies of the trademark registrations take a very long time. Uh, so you have to have all that stuff prepared which is going to really set up on them.
Anything else? All right, well, thank you all very much, and feel free to...